Hello and welcome to Hair in the Hawthorne. My name's Kate Ray and I'm one of your two hosts. Um, you'll all be very familiar with my lovely host, Neil Rushton, who is again joining me on the sofa. He's been a little bit absent uh, for one or two of the ones where I've sat on my own and just blithered on. You've all listened very, very kindly to that. So it's nice to have Neil back on board. And we have a brand spanking new guest, which is always, always exciting. and uh, One that I'm really looking forward to, uh, depth diving, diving into some uh, great topics and some artwork, which really floats my boat. I'm going to hand you over to Neil. He's going to do the introductions um, and, and I welcome you both. Thank you, Kate. That's fantastic. And today we are honoured and privileged to have from over the pond. I know you don't like that phrase, Kate, but um, uh, we have the wonderful Barbara Fisher. Uh, but before I go on, Barbara, where exactly are you in the States? I'm in Athens, Ohio, which is in the southeastern Appalachian portion of Ohio. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, the Appalachians, we, we might talk about that um, a, a little later because, well, just because you'll be able to uh, shed some light on non-British fairies. We usually do talk about British and Irish fairies, it has to be said, so it's always good to get that American perspective. We've had our mutual friend Joshua Cutchin on before and yeah. um who, who's, who's always great um uh yeah so so the american perspective so to speak from ohio in in this case so barbara before we get into the meat of the matter do you want to just say uh, a few words about yourself and most specifically how did you gain an interest um into the the, the fairy phenomenon in all its guises okay um i was born and raised in west virginia uh, half half in Charleston, which is the capital city, and half in a rural area on my grandparents' farm. So I was running around in the in the hills and the hollers at their farm, and in in town I was you know often at my other grandmother's house, and my other grandmother had a link to old fairy stories herself. Um, she had seen a fairy when she was a child. Uh, the fairy actually helped her find hidden treasure, as it were. She had borrowed one of her mother's rings with a pearl on it, and it fell off of her finger somewhere outside. And she was terrified her mother would would kill her. Uh, so she she went out and she's like, oh, where is it? Where is it? Help me find it. Help me find it. And there was a flash of light you know, after frantic searchings all through the yard, there was a flash of light over in a corner under a willow tree. And she ran over there and got a glimpse of a very small lady in white. And she was pointing at the ground. You know, she was all but grabbing her head and going, look down there. And so Graham uh, looked and there it was sitting where she had already looked several times on top of a, you know, a plant and leaf just sitting there. So this broad leafed plant, just like it had fallen and it had caught it. Yeah. Um, so she told me that story and uh, she, you know, when she'd brush my hair, if I had tangles in my hair, she'd say the pixies had put them there. And it was because they liked me. Um, but I don't know about that. I think that that was torment, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, so I was kind of born into the interest of them. Um, the other thing that my uh, grandmother did, she had a copy of Jane Warner Watson's um, golden book, giant golden book of elves and fairies with illustrations by Garth Williams. Full color. She had an original first edition and um, it was it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous work. And she read to me from that and that's where I learned the William Allingham poem the fairies so up the airy mountain and down yeah. the rushing glen we daren't go a hunting for fear of little men I have it memorized from childhood like by the time I was five I could you know chant it along with her so it came to me honestly and that's obviously influenced you all the way through your life and sort of carried it carried it with you and what point was it where um you found yourself becoming 
I suppose more um, adult and serious about the fairies because it obviously influences your work and a whole whole variety of your work. So, at what point did that happen? I think. Well, okay, so the Brian Froud Alan Lee book Fairies came out. Um, first time I saw it was my aunt was a librarian and she had it at her house and we were visiting them that's up in northern ohio where it's flat and it's right next to the lake and uh you know she's like i think you'll like this and she handed it to me and that whole 10 days we were there i basically read it over and over and over and at that point i had already started reading older fairy lore at the library at home but that really galvanized me towards, you know, reading even more fairy lore because there were there were fairies that I had never seen mentioned. Uh, so I went right to Evans Wentz and Catherine Briggs and started learning, you know, the old stories, but also sort of a Jungian perspective on, you know, are these actual beings? Are they separate from us? Are they part of us? There's so many different ways to look at it. So that was about when I was 12, 13, 14. So it was pretty serious for me from, you know, early on. And, and then well, I also well, saw things. So, well, well, we will definitely come on to that. But just sort of just backtrack uh, for a moment. Uh, obviously, you already mentioned the Appalachians yes. and the. I, I think the general historical consensus is that a lot of the Appalachians were settled by Irish and Scots. And mm -hmm. do you think that has, well, this is a difficult, difficult way to sum this up, but do you think there's a kind of transference of those Celtic, if we can call it Celtic, belief systems, specifically of the fairies, and they've just been transported to America in the 17th, 18th century, and especially the Appalachians. So just, you know, do you think the Appalachians are a special place? Uh, yes. Uh, the settlers who came were the Scottish people who were thrown out of Scotland into Ireland. And so they hung out with the Irish. And then, you know, when they opened, well, shoot really a lot of them were sent here as as indentured servants so they kind of got here that way and once they were you know freed from their contract once the contract was null and void they then went to places to get land that were cheap and uh the mountain land is not easy to farm uh, but the Scottish people were like, hey, we're Highlanders. We're not afraid of that. <laughs> and so they went there. Um, the Irish folk who were with them were also not afraid of, you know, hilly country or forests or anything like that. And so they they settled there. And a lot of them intermarried with the Cherokee people who at that time spanned from Georgia all the way up to the border between West Virginia and Ohio, um, the Ohio River. That's the natural border. Um, and and they fought with the you know they fought with the Shawnee every now and then over parts of West Virginia, you know. And uh, so th it's all a bunch of mountain people, people who weren't afraid of the mountains. Um, one of the things I found out not that long ago is that the Appalachian range is actually the same range that you have in Scotland and Northern England in Yorkshire and parts of Ireland that, you know, when Pengai split it, it, you know, they drifted apart, but it's the same ancient range. I, I have seen that map recently. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting, isn't it? Not only, it, you know, it's a geographical phenomenon as well as a cultural phenomenon although almost as though they're mirroring each other yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting yeah. yeah i that that just blew my mind when i thought <laughs> about it i mean it does beg the question i mean uh, neil and i speak quite often about the connection between um uh, all kinds of phenomena really and and the land and, and and whether there is that connection between earth energies and and specific uh, spaces and places that either generate or invoke 
different energies and if you have that split that's a, along the same line and the you know the same earth energies that, that are split off is it then that um you know you have that that celtic um fey phenomena that goes off there because of the earth energies um and and then that was just enhanced by these people from from that that part of the world coming over into that area it's, it's just that's a fascinating coincidence isn't it yeah it, it's it's amazing i some part of me thinks that they felt comfortable in the Appalachians, not just because it was, you know, generic hills, but because there was pieces of home in there and, you know, and it felt right. I'll also mention that most of the tribes of the United States, the the indigenous people, most of them had stories about fairy like people. Um, there's lots of little people stories. They all have different names. I'm not going to say them in Cherokee because I'll <laughs> destroy it's a very difficult language I'll destroy it. Um but there there are similar beings like the Aishi of Ireland. Those I can say, Nenehi. <laughs> they were the same size as humans, maybe a little taller or a little shorter, but they were always beautiful representations of a human. You know, so they were extra pretty. And they lived up in the um, bald mountains, in the Smoky Mountains, and they lived in big granite boulders and, it, or in hills. Is that I'm 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 I'm, going, I, I'm off on one already. Is is there other phenomena that takes place within within that range? Is is it kind of a a hot spot for for other uh, phenomena? Um, UFO, alien, uh, cryptid, that kind of thing. Is it is it kind of a hot spot for that? Oh yeah, it it really is. Um, if speaking just sort of generally, there are ghosts. What are called ghost lights or orbs, or you know those damned meandering lights, as J. Allen Hynek said at one point. They're all over Appalachia, and I swear people are seeing more of them now. I don't know. Maybe it's more acceptable to talk about it, but there are very famous spots like the Brown Mountain. Uh, lights in North Carolina and they've been seen since you know before white settlers got there and they they appear regularly and it's really funny because the explanation for them as the years go by gets weirder and, and stupider because you know in the 19th century well there was a train out there you know and then the train you know the the track disintegrated and and there was a wreck and it was terrible so there wasn't a train there but they still saw lights um, and then a road, of course, in the 20th century got built and they were like, ah, it's just car headlights. But, you know, before it was a train. So what also headlights don't sort of go up from the mountain into the sky and then float down. <laughs> so the the skeptical arguments as to what they are are hilarious, but they're all over the Appalachians. Just that Brown Mountain's really famous. That, yeah, no, that's really interesting because when I, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> when I was on your podcast, Barbara, we were talking about the the Wollaton, oh, the Wollaton, the, the Wollaton, Wollaton. No, Wollaton Knowns, okay, okay. the pronunciation, I, I, I pronounce Wollaton Wollaton and I'm very posh and Kate is, uh, is Not a local. Not very posh. Is a local, <laughs> so she says Wollaton. <laughs> anyway, when when Barbara, you and I were talking about the, the, the Wollaton Gnome story where the little kids go into the park and they see the gnomes in the cars and we got on to the subject of light and how the gnomes were emanating some kind of light in that dusk environment and we talked we didn't talk too long about what that phenomenon might be and i think this will lead us on to oh yeah the 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 john keel stuff and uh but, but but for the moment, do you want to say something about what you think those orbs, the lights, the light phenomenon are? Because, as you say, obviously, the, the, the sceptical argument, the reductionist argument, oh, well, there's always something um, physical to account mm -hmm. for and that it, pheno it phenomenon. Doesn't, yeah, well, it doesn't well, generally work. As, as, <laughs> as, as, yeah. as, as those arguments don't, but they've been, that they are the mainstream. So coming out of the mainstream what do you think about that light phenomenon when connected to uh, entities such as fairies or, or whatever we're talking about 
I actually, okay, so I'm working on a book with a uh, a co-author that's about light phenomena, um, anomalous light phenomena. That's that's our fancy way of putting little orbs floating around, meandering, whatever. ILPs. Uh, yes, I think that they really are the the natural form of whatever it is we're interacting with that it is either a an, an intelligent plasmoid creature or it is the means by which an unseen intelligence interacts with humans and some people see just the lights other people see the lights in shapes of humanoid form um including scientists at Hestelen up in Norway. They've seen some humanoids running about and that I wish I was there fly on the wall to see that mm -hmm. because that would be funny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us it's all in our heads again. Um, anyway, I think that's the native form. You know, we have ghost lights, we have glowing ghosts, we have glowing beings in the woods. Bigfoot wanders around sometimes popping out of a flash of light or he's carrying an orb or you see lights in the sky and then you look over off to your left because you heard a noise and then there's Bigfoot. Um, you know, there's been glowing cryptids coming in and out of water. There's, you know, my own father, when he was in the Navy, there was a, a light that was near the surface of the water and it, it shadowed his ship. He was on night watch and he saw it so you know they, they did all these things to figure out what it was and it was on sonar it was on radar but it wasn't it wasn't a soviet craft it wasn't anything that they could figure out um but you know i've read in in research for this book about fireballs coming up out of the ocean still fiery and um that you know, I'm used to them falling in the ocean. That's that's normal. But coming up out of it, and, you know, these are things that are repeated all over the world. So I kind of think that the the light is the, the thing, and then all of the shapes are other things. Or, well, okay, all of the shapes are are cloaks that the light puts on or a costume light to talk with us. And it's partly generated by our own brains. Yeah. I think a lot of this is telepathic, but a lot of it is also physical. I've taken a couple of photographs um, that basically told me, no, this isn't completely in your head. There is something that is emitting photons. It's emitting waves or particles that your camera can pick up. So, yeah. That, I mean, for, and, for me, I, I, I'm fascinated by the whole uh, orb um, anomalous light phenomena. Um, I'm a paranormal investigator. It's a massive bone of contention over here within the paranormal ghost hunting community um, with the majority of people that speak about it on the side of it's not a phenomena. You know, it's, it's very discounted as a phenomena. Um, myself, I've actually um, encountered um uh what i thought were very very normal um uh, lights i would say that there were marsh lights or gas lights over a um over a graveyard when i was when i was a child that were seen quite often in the summer um and it wasn't until i was talking to friends when i was an older teenager um that they made me realize how very bizarre and they didn't believe me that it was a phenomenon that happened, but it was something that other people had experienced. Um, like you, I think that there is a, there is lo lots of different scope for explanation um, and lots of different uh, light phenomena. Are, are um, They vary, don't they, from sort of mm -hmm. the, oh, the, yeah. the very, very small to the very, very big. And, um, and one, one of the ones um, that I like as, as, as a theory is that it is um, the opening or closing of a portal. So um, the, the second time I've experienced it was when I, I uh, came across a being that was that, that had come through and it was like an old fashioned TV, you know, when you switch off an old fashioned television and it goes, yeah, like that. Yeah. 
that, that mm-hmm. but it creates that orb just suspended for for a few seconds absolutely yeah. fascinates me we have a lot of viewers from from that that ghost hunting um sort of uh, uh field um over over here that, that watch the program and I would love to start convincing them. Um, what what case would you would you put forward? What 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 few things could you say to them to say, look, this is something to be taken seriously? Well, okay, so I've gone through at least 65, 70 books now. And people see these things all around the world, give different explanations for them. I like the portal one too. It makes sense. Um some scientists at Skinwalker Ranch saw a an orb, and this was a physicist. Was it two physicists? I think it was two physicists, but they had on infrared goggles. So they were, you know, sitting out watching things, and they saw this orb, and out of it came a shadowy being, and they watched it happen. And they recorded it happening. Um, I would throw those guys at people and be like, well, now here we go. I'd also, uh, you know, one of the things in my podcast, I was talking with uh, uh, Heather Moser, and she's a paranormal investigator. And she also is a researcher for uh, Small Town Monsters, uh, the people who do documentaries and she said that she for the first time ever had seen orbs inside of a haunted location here in Lancaster Ohio which is just down the road from us about 40 minutes and she said it terrified me there were these lights floating around the room and you know my co-host and I were like (laughs) We see that all the time. Don't be scared of it. It's not going to do anything to you. She's like, really? Do you see that? I'm like, mm-hmm. yep. And different, different contexts, but we do see them. And no, they haven't harmed anybody that I personally know of. So I wouldn't be terrified of it. And she said it was the weirdest thing. She had never seen it. I also know of another investigator who is, She's one of the ones that you can call a skeptic, but she's not insanely skeptical, you know, where everything is wrong. And she said, I saw an orb at a haunted location. She goes, I didn't take a picture that had nothing in it. And then an orb appeared. No, I saw it with my eyes. I'm like, girl, you don't need to tell me over and over. I have seen so many of those. And she was like, it was like the size of a ping pong ball. And it flew right at me. I went, yep, yep. That's, mm -hmm, I know. So I would just say, discounting it all as photographic um camera aberrations or something in the lens or dust particles that the flash is bouncing off of you know the photographs i took i didn't use a flash at all and i had seen them with my eyes i was actually i honestly wasn't even trying to photograph it i decided hey i'm gonna look at through my you know phone and see if I can see it through the camera. So I'm doing this, you know, dodge back and forth. And I'm like, oh, I can see it. And I just, I didn't even think too hard. I just clicked it. And, oh, there it was. And then another time I saw a lot of lights with a lot of movement in the woods. And I did photograph that. But I don't, I don't put that out publicly. And some people may say that's a case of, well, it's not really anything. And she doesn't want to say, No, it's because I don't want to upset any living being that that might be that lives in my woods. Mm -hmm. Back to fairies. This is is so interesting. The whole physical and non-physical aspects of the fairy phenomenon, you can extend it to to UFOs or or any other paranormal um, uh, subject matter. I used to be of the opinion that they were all non-physical and operating within our non-physical consciousness whether Mm -hmm. individual or collective and i think that's i still think that's partly right but whatever they are and if we call the overall phenomenon a a light phenomenon of whatever type um it's 
evidently able to interact with physical reality and leave imprints for you know mm -hmm. imprints of all sort i don't just mean you know footsteps or or, or, or ufo landings uh, uh imprint uh, a cultural imprint mm -hmm. as well as a physical imprint mm -hmm. um sometimes not to the extent you will i i I may be proved wrong here, but we will never find the body of a fairy because I don't uh, think so. Because a fairy is coming from a non physical reality and somehow almost certainly connected with our own consciousness at a collective or individual level is able to interact with us for whatever time period. You know, I've, I've experienced it myself and it feels physical, mm -hmm. but you know, there's something bigger behind it. It's not just a little bloke who is a little mm -hmm. bloke who you could shake hands with and um uh, uh, and then will live and die it's something else and sorry it's a very rambling way of coming to just taking a step back for a moment there is that if we accept that light phenomenon uh, do you think i mean you've almost already answered this do you think we are predisposed individually culturally socially to uh, interpret that light phenomenon in a certain way. So you you were talking about Brian Froude and Alan Lee's book Fairies, which you engage with from a very young age. Do you mm -hmm. think, however many years later, when you see a, a a fairy, that's what's if you're predisposed to see that light phenomenon as that? Do you think that there's something in that? Oh yeah, I think you're right. Uh, okay, so when we first started seeing lights here in this town. First off, we did not know that that was a thing here in this town and has been a thing since the 19th century. We were college students and we only talked mostly among our peers and then the neo-pagan community. And it wasn't until I talked with the neo-pagan community, they're like, oh, the little lights in the woods. Yeah, those are a thing. You know, oh, well, why didn't you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> when it first started, it wasn't even at my house. Um, it was at a of a pair of friends houses and it, they were seeing lights in the woods and it became such a regular occurrence that even uh the the house owner who was the father of one of the people living in the house had come by to fix a drain and looked out the window and was like hey what are all those lights over there and his son not wanting to explain just kind of went um nothing dad so we started calling them the um nothings. <laughs> um, but when I got involved with it, it then started morphing into something that was more easily seen as fairies and by others as fairies. So I was like, okay, so you guys, did you like latch on to what's in my head and then sort of extend it out to other people? What What is that? Um, and I don't, I don't like, that ex explanation because it makes me feel like I'm saying I'm special, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think that I am predisposed to seeing a fairy rather than an alien a, because I knew about fairies before I knew about aliens and B because the grays can just suck it and go away. I don't like them. They're mean. So <laughs> I'm like with you on that one. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. I don't like those guys. They're no, nasty and weird. They are. E.T. did that to me. Apparently I screamed the entire way through the film E.T. because he was the bad guy and nobody yeah. knew it. You know, what's interesting is that was kind of the original idea of the story was that he was supposed to be kind of not so cute and cool. And that he was kind of drawing the, the children in by being cute. and I, But the, the Spielberg went with the, the cute and cuddly and not threatening version. He was uh, not cute and cuddly or non-threatening. He, thre <laughs> he threatened me. <laughs> I, did, I, I didn't I, much care for him either. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to say that, um, as you know, Bob, you know, okay, you don't like the grace, but there are plenty of fairy types that mm -hmm. are to be avoided at all costs as, oh as, yeah as as yeah. we as we all know yes and and <laughs> the grays are like some of them and i will yeah. i will accept that that may just be a new shape for a, a, a an old older nastier set of beings that aren't you know because 
I remember not that long ago I had said, oh, you know, somebody said, I really wish I could see a fairy like you. And I was like, you know, you don't, you don't really, <laughs> you don't really. And she was like, well, what do you mean? I went, okay. You think about Tinkerbell, but you know, even in Disney, Tinkerbell was not a nice person. Mm -hmm. She tried to murder Wendy by proxy. <laughs> she, she tried to get the lost boys to shoot her down. Yes. You know, and and then she'd get jealous with Peter and then go and sell him out to the to the pirates. She was not a good girlfriend. She was she was she she was herself. And she was like, well, but and I'm like, no, well, but the, the lore is not cute. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, there are people who have strong interactions with them who survive the experience but for every one of those there's 10 15 others that it didn't work out that way yeah and i said and yes they're beautiful but that beauty comes with a price yeah. and that price is not pleasant and uh she was like, oh, well, okay. You know, and I was like, okay, whatever, new age girl. If you want to get in trouble, <laughs> just, just. Yeah, she, yeah. She, needs, she needs to learn by experience. It, although I, it, it, it is interesting looking at the the already published and the, the soon to be published second part of the Fairy Investigation Society census with Simon yes, Young I'm looking putting forward it together. To yeah, me, me too. And, but you look through all of those entries and there are a few frightening ones. But for mm -hmm. the most part, it's uh, these people are, have a sense of amazement more mm -hmm. than any, anything else. And that's, I get the impression through all of the various subjective accounts, testimonials that you get of modern fairy sightings, mm -hmm. that they seem to have calmed down a little bit from their folklore ancestors. Uh, our, our ancestors were afraid mm -hmm. of the fairies, whereas now, as the fairies become the fairy phenomenon becomes more well known people are more well this is just interesting and when i have an experience it's an amazing experience that's that's certainly my yeah. my, my personal uh, experience do, do you think that's right i think it's i think it's true i think part of our it is i we can't blame it all on disney um part of our idea of fairies as nature spirits and caregivers to the trees and and all of that stuff came from theosophy where blavatsky said that they were a lower order of intelligence than humans but they are powerful elementals that protect the you know woods and the trees so i think that that view of them has become dominant and most people don't even know where it came from mm -hmm. You know, I say Blavatsky, everybody goes, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so she's like stealth, you know, she she's all in the new age and all kinds of other little, you know, or big movements. And she was very influential. And uh, I think that's part of how that has come about. And then all the ones that are kind of really nasty have kind of gravitated over to, hey, we're spacemen. Hey, we're... <laughs> We're uh, taking samples of your genetics because uh, we need to, and <laughs> we're maybe making hybrids. It's a genetic thing. That's what it is, huh? you know, because there's some early ones, some early space uh, UFO experiences, especially in Europe, where these guys act like fairies, you know, they come down in this shining ship. Okay. So that's a spaceship. Okay. 1950s. We've seen science fiction. We know about Sputnik. Okay. So it's a spaceship and they'll do weird stuff like accost women who are picking flowers and steal their flowers, or they will go to a woman who's hanging up her laundry and steal her damn stockings off the line. Now, what kind of space dude, is going to come all the way from Arcturus or wherever yeah. and somebody's pantyhose. I mean, why? <laughs> well, well, uh, well, yeah, that, that's, that's a big question, but um, it's <laughs> the, the, the ones that gets me, and, and this happens multiple times is where and it's often involving children. They'll come out of the spaceship or whatever it really is. And they'll have little biscuits Yes, mm -hmm. and the, you know, they'll give them to the kiddies. <laughs> the kiddies take them home and say, Oh, some, some, 
some spacemen have given us biscuits and of course occasionally these have yeah. been tried and they usually sort of oh they're just oatmeal biscuits but the 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 principle remains that there's been an extraordinary experience mm -hmm. and they do something so banal which is typical fairy folklore it is oh, yeah. and 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 so lo exactly as you're saying there was that transition period between the traditional fairy folklore which died during the 20th century to a great extent and became disneyfied or whatever we want to call it uh and then it got skyfied mm -hmm. but you look at and you know we all know someone like Graham Hancock, who's written about this in in his 2005 book Supernatural, I think that's the best. He's done the best job of talking about how fairy folklore morphed into Skyfire UFOs, mm. and that actually yeah. there are so many similarities. Even if you go back to the some of the 19th century testimonials uh, stories, it sounds ooh, that sounds like the inside of a, a of an alien spacecraft. It's 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 round. It's dimly lit. They're doing weird mm -hmm. things. Um, so uh, where, that, offers, where, where... that offers up a really good question. Actually, that offers yeah. up the question of. Um, do fairies modernize themselves? I'm sure of it. I'm Me sure too. of it. I've, you know, I've, I've heard enough testimony from people who had experiences with some strange person who was looked mostly like a person was wearing modern clothes. Um, but were just not quite right. And uh, there's a testimony from a man who was it. He's he was Irish. I believe it was in Belfast, but I'm not sure. Um, but he was just you know he was out on the town drinking and having fun and hanging out, and his friends went home, and then he's by himself, and this guy comes up to him, and he looks mostly okay, but he says. Do you know where I could find a woman? I need a woman really badly. Now, okay. Um, and the guy was like, I'm gay, so I don't know. Just out there, you know, just go out there. And he said there was something about him that was very off-putting. Well, he keeps running across this man. You know, he even goes on on public transportation, goes across town, and the man is still there. And and he gets weirder and more off-putting as as the evening goes on, and then he gets lost in his own neighborhood. So he that's when he started to realize, wait, this sounds like being pixie led. And then he thought about the kinds of beings, fairy beings, who you know fed off of affection and sex and love. And then he was like, oh my god, I know what that is. I've got to find my way home. Mm. and and he turned his shirt inside out he went yeah, home of course, of course you know <laughs> so <laughs> um but yeah i i think that they do try to fit in um because i mean even in the old lore if if you weren't seeing one of the really little guys um they were maybe a little bit shorter than humans and, you know, they just show up at your door. And if you live in a village, you know, everybody who lives there. You, you, I mean, even if it's a hundred people, you humans can memorize a hundred faces and names, mm -hmm. see them every day. And it's a stranger and it's a strange lady. And she says, could I borrow a cup of oats? And you give them to her, even though you're poor. And then she smiles and says, tomorrow, when you open your bin, it'll be full. And it'll always be full. And that was late 19th century, early 20th century mm -hmm. testimony from a woman. And she said, that's when I knew, you know. And then you go to uh, the northern Midwest in the 1950s and you have Joe Simonton, the chicken farmer, who's out in his field and watches a UFO. Oh, no, he comes upon it already landed. So he comes upon it and he says, there's two men there. They looked Italian. So my guess is they probably looked Sicilian. So they were dark skinned and had black hair. And he said one was cooking pancakes on a stove. And the other one asked if they could have some fresh water, some clean water. He said, so I, you know, he's a farmer. He's going to go get him water. He's polite. 
So he brings a pitcher of water or a bucket of water and gives it to him. And in return, they give him these these pancakes, yes. which are made out of buckwheat hulls and water uh, because he saved one of them to give to the Air Force for analysis. And he gave it up and that's what it was. It didn't have any salt. That was the part that jumped out at me because mm. that's one of the things that are said that the fairies don't eat salt. Mm. So... That's the yeah, same so, story, kind of, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. That's a, that's a famous story. You reminded <laughs> me of that. That now. So, so without wanting to ask sort of the biggest question in the universe, <laughs> I'm going to. What are they, and why are they coming into our reality? Now, I know you're not going to be able to answer that because no one's been able to answer that. But no. just, just give me, you know, do you think? Actually, let's simplify the question. Do you think the fairies in all of their guises, whether it's historic past or, or the present, do you think that they exist in some form in an alternative reality dimension from this phys physical reality? Yeah, I do think they do. I think they exist on another plane of reality, um, and they exist invisibly beside us anyway. And I think most people can't see them unless they want to be seen. Um, I Now, what are they? I Some part of me sometimes thinks that they are the other half of us who are not embodied at this time, you know, not enrobed in flesh, as it were that they are pure spirit, pure energy, pure consciousness. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, you know, is it that when we die, we're going to become weirdos who like, you know, go bother embodied people. I, you know, cause their, their behavior is so odd in so many ways, but they want something from us. They always have. And I feel like they always will. Um, one of the things in uh, Whitley Strieber's latest book, well, no, he's he's written another one since then. Um, he, it was uh, A New World. That's the name of it. So it was the next to the latest book. Uh -huh. One of the things that one of his visitors said was very telling to me and somewhere in the back of my brain, it latched in there and I couldn't let it go. I feel like they accidentally told the truth for once, you know, almost straight up. Because Strieber had asked, what is it that you do? And they said, we rearrange atoms. And my brain grabbed it. And then, the, you know, the Mr. Spock that lives in the back of my head started, you know, worrying at it and thinking about it and prying it apart. And I was like, huh. So that explains how you go through walls. That explains how you change shape. That that's actually, hmm, you know, that's that's maybe how you create a fairy ring. You know, you change the composition of the soil. I was like, so maybe they change things. That's what they do, and they do change people. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. If we're going to look at grays, some people are like, mm -mm, no. No, don't like it. Others are like, oh, they're here to help bring peace. You know, and I do think some of them really believe that. And and it may be the case that some of the grays aren't nearly as horrible as others, but it might also be Stockholm syndrome. You know, sometimes I, I think there might be some of that happening, but they change people. And one of the things that fairies were always talked about as doing was you know they were uh, attracted to poets and artists and musicians they loved feasting and song and dance so they also liked to inspire poets musicians writers yes so i kind of think it's some sort of symbiosis that's happening Another thing that where an entity said something that I think was very, very true happened, I believe, in Iowa. It was in the 1960s. Uh, a uh, highway patrolman saw a, a downed vehicle of some sort, 
and there were people fixing it. And one of them came up after he stopped his car and they were talking back and forth. And at the end of the conversation, the space person said, we want you to believe in us, but not too much. <laughs> so there's that dichotomy of, you know, physical, non-physical belief, disbelief. They, another time they pretty much told the truth. You know, we want to be in the shadowy realm in between consciousness and unconsciousness. That's where we we live and breathe. So maybe maybe that has something to do with it. But yeah, I think they do exist outside of us, but they sure do like to have to do with us too. Mm. Yes. There, there is there is that, sorry, Neil, there is that trickster element with all these stories, isn't there? And, and um the majority of encounters that we hear about with with fairies. And some of the encounters with uh, with alien it, it is the the big the biggest theme is is the trickster and I like to think of that uh, as um, as kind of a playful innocent that innocence that as there's us as material human beings we kind of we've lost we, and we have it as a, as children and it mm -hmm. goes and it kind of coexists with the curiosity that we have as children and and we lose it but the face seem to embody it completely don't they 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 don't ever seem to they are peter pan they don't ever seem to to grow up do they no not really you know um jm barry when he wrote peter pan the whole concept of a boy who never grows up um really it, i mean if you sit and you you know psychoanalyze that story boy boy do you get a lot of that's fertile mm -hmm. field for all kinds of analysis um, and then if you know any of his biography, it goes in there and you go, wow, that's, that's deep. That's way deeper than Disney. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has that trickster element of a being that is stunted in growth in some way, but it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is kind of terrible when you think about it, but it's not completely terrible. And he embodies that playful fun loving i mean granted some of his fun lovingness morphs into letting a guy get eaten by a giant alligator with a, a you know a clock in its stomach but <laughs> <laughs> hook was apparently just terrible anyway so yeah. um uh that's that could be what's what that is but yeah it's it's the desire to intrigue people to engage curiosity to engage playfulness um and i'm not saying that you know terrible things don't happen mm -hmm. with weird phenomena with people sometimes it really messes people up but other times it inspires things in people and i think that's why we can't let go of that phenomena as much as materialist society would like us to. I absolutely we can't let go of it. I absolutely agree 100%. And that's a perfect segue. Once again, you thought we re rehearsed this. It's a perfect <laughs> segue to finish off because we've only got about 10 minutes left, I think. Okay. And we really want to talk to you about your, your, your paintings, how you do it, why you do it. And unfortunately this is go means you're going to rely on my technical abilities to share the screen with some of barbara's images so this could be a little bit clunky folk bear with us you know we are a professional setup but sometimes <laughs> things get a little bit difficult um so what i'm going to do barbara is just put some images or, or share the images one by one and you might be able to just t t tell me what, what you know what was going through your mind what are you trying to portray in these images now i want to start with this one okay that was that was for that's, last week's that's episode for la that's for last week's episode exactly and um this is the this is the wallace and gnomes and mm -hmm. i was delighted that you you took the time to put this lovely little image together uh from from from, from the story so do you I'm sure you didn't do it just for me. So what what may what, just tell us what, what's going through your mind when you when you've when you've made this well, image? Well, the way that I do the these images, and it's mostly with fairies that I do it, or 
you know, supernatural beings of some sort is I always start with watercolor and I start pretty much purely abstractly. Um, and I have a specific technique where I load the, the brush up with paint. It's always a larger brush. Um, it's a round brush. So it's, you know, it's oval shaped looking and pointed at the tip. And I just dab color in layers on it. Um, it, it, it just tapping the brush, this oversized brush onto the paint onto the paper, onto the paint, onto the paper in various colors. Then I'll let it dry and I'll look at it. And then I'll usually add one or two other layers of the same technique of dabbling. And what that does, because I use such a uh, textured paper, is it will leave enough impressions and changes in color, lightness, darkness, that I can start to see creatures in it, faces usually. Um, I call this like pareidolia painting. Mm. And so that's what I did with this. And you can see in the background, there's some little people that are very, very misty and, and kind of like you can't really quite see them. That's actually how I see most fairies, by the way, when I see them is... I can almost see them and they shift change color or shape as, as I'm watching. And then you have these very solid looking birds up in the trees. And then I put the trees in and that is a process of layers of color with paint and um, colored pencil and watercolor pencil. It, this one took me probably about seven days of layering, letting it dry, layering, letting it dry. And but the all of the little guys, all of the little gnome guys, they started out as a pareidolia. Mm. You know, even the ones in the foreground started out as a pareidolia. And uh, because I could see those little faces in there, it's very little work for me to take uh, a colored pencil or watercolor pencil and just bring it forward so other people can see it. That's um, really that's really interesting in. What you're talking about, the pareidolia, and well, I'm, I'm going to pull up another another image now for so we can, which might better. Which one am I looking for? This one. Oh yeah, that one. That so, one's so, a, so yeah. for a start, what what what's that? What's that one called? Um, where fairies meet. Yeah. And this one, you can see very clearly the pareidolia that are involved. Um, it's because I didn't paint all of them in perfectly. I wanted it to be like where people could be drawn to see faces that aren't quite finished. So they're like coming into being in front of you. Yeah. Um, this one is more layered. And I also used a photograph of the base painting to put it into procreate which is a, a digital art program and then do some of it digitally so the tree and most of the really really strongly articulated faces were done in in uh procreate but That's you brilliant. can't really tell yeah so. no it's uh, it's uh you know i should, can can people go on to your website and see these images Yes, yes. That's... Most of these are images for episode art. So if they go to sixdegreesofjohnkeel.com and just go to the episodes page, and then all of the art is mine or it's photographs that I've taken and altered. But most of it is, you know, either digital art or analog art or a combination. Yeah. Can I can I go back um, because we're talking about your artwork and you, you mentioned about, you know, we know that the fairies are attracted to and um, will help and assist sort of artists, musicians, writers, etc. And you mentioned sort of part way through this about you, um, you didn't understand I, I don't think special is quite the, how you become an ambassador or a, a, a conduit or a vessel for uh, fairies to be able to be seen or to, to interact with you. Um, now, 
if if you are artistic that that is something that definitely comes about but did your art grow out of um do you think your interaction and understanding with the fae or was it the other way around that the fae were attracted to you because of of your um of your creativity i think it's both i think because when i was a child i was wildly creative and i was really i was perfectly happy playing by myself quietly reading or drawing I drew all the time and painted all the time and did crazy stuff like make sculptures out of construction paper there's a reason it's called construction um so I would make little sculptures out of it and it was always tinged with weird Mm -hmm. there was always something a little bit strange about it um and if I look at my paintings now it's interesting I love I love Froud and Lee but my stuff looks like Garth Williams's paintings. Yeah. It really does. I had many books that was that were illustrated by him that weren't the fairy book. But if I draw fairies or witches or something and I'm not trying to be scary about it, they're going to look more like his. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, yeah, but it's what I love about your art, I'm just going to show one final image, which is a very good one. This is, do you want to tell us? what that's called oh that one is ellen of the ways Mm -hmm. um and it's it started as a regular uh landscape and i did all of that in paint and colored pencil um and some pastel and at the very end i i filled in ellen herself and made her part of the landscape yeah, no, and it's, it's, yeah, I I really like that one. That, that that that's that's what encompasses so much for me. You, you've got obviously Ellen, the main sort of focus that you're drawn into. There's a stone circle there. There's some cottages, but you look around that picture, as with all of your images, I think, and you start to see the paradolia. Mm-hmm. You start to see the the slightly amorphous figures, the the heads, and in recent months, in fact, it was since i visited kate kate uh at joe hickey hall we went to walton park and we were seeing paradulia in trees everywhere mm-hmm. and since since then every time i go out now they're everywhere in the trees and we were talking earlier on about nature spirits are the fairies nature spirits well i think in part they probably are and paradolia mm-hmm. is an interface with with the humans that only goes so far when you see paradolia in a tree, um, uh, a reductionist materialist would say, well, you're just making up shapes for, from your brain, recognizable mm-hmm. shapes. Uh, no, they're wrong as usual. Mm-hmm. These these <laughs> are the, whatever intrinsic spiritual phenomenon is part of that, in this case, a tree. Uh, uh, it, it comes in many parts and it's just showing itself to you in paradolia. And mm-hmm. if you were maybe to be in a more altered state of consciousness, you could go beyond that paradolia and find out what they what they really are. That's my kind of working hypothesis at the moment. And I love what you do in these images because I, I just spend ages looking at each image and right, that's 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 a dozen faces I've seen. Oh um, yeah. And that that's obviously well, I'm saying it's obviously that is of is that in your mind as you're painting it, or do they come? Oh, yeah. they, they come but- naturally. The pareidolia come naturally. Um, her, the shape of her head was there before I decided. Oh, that's I'm gonna that. It was oh, there's there's Ellen. <laughs> I just kind of it. It was right there. I'm like oh yeah, I should make her antlers look like trees, and uh, <laughs> that was it. And then painting along, making the tree line, and then the the cliff face down below with the ocean. I started seeing faces and I was like, yeah. yeah, I could elaborate those, but I'm not going to, I'm going to let people find them. Yeah. But that comes about just from putting paint on the paper in a certain way. But I don't think about it when I'm doing it. I, I think that part is, is the important part is I don't go, well, I'm going to put pareidolia in there, you know, <laughs> then it's not pareidolia. It, it's, sure. it's yeah. Artistic expression. So it's different. Exactly. 
They're absolutely beautiful. I, I I really enjoy them as well. I really enjoy that that kind of secret quality about uh, about your work. You know where you can sort of pick things out. And I, I I've got to tell you, I've got I've got tiles in my bathroom that do that to me every time I can be laying in the bath, and I, I literally I'll see new faces every time I have a bath in mm-hmm. the in the patterns of the tiles. It it fascinates me because it does take you into a into an altered state, doesn't it? When you're doing that, because you you, you know you sort of half meditating on on what you're looking at yeah. do, do, you know, do you know do you know what what i see mostly in trees in the past few weeks are faces and they've all got big noses what's that what's that trying to tell me i'll tell you afterwards neil <laughs> <laughs> we, won't, we won't do that on on, on the live on, on the recording <laughs> maybe not maybe we'll do the, uh, the you know the psychological analysis some other time when uh, people aren't listening <laughs> I, we are I, I can't believe how quick this has gone I I seriously could be chatting for hours and I know I say that about a lot of our guests but it's it's been really really easy and it's so much of a pleasure um that you know when we find people who are you know on, on a wavelength and and it, you know somebody who just takes you that little bit further with you thinking it's definitely been that with me uh listening to you today um before we wrap up um could you tell people about uh, your your brilliant website and the podcast that you do and some of the guests you've had on and the kind of breadth you've got such a breadth of, of um, it, you know, it just spans out. It's just fascinating. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, it's called Six Degrees of John Keel, and that's a podcast. And we started out with a lot of experiencer stories, but, and that's still the, my favorite because I always get surprised oh, by what people tell me. Um, and it fascinates me. Uh, but it's also, and the reason we named it that is because in the opening of strange creatures from time and space, Keel says within 100 miles of you, someone has seen a hairy monster walk out in front of their car at night while they're driving. And within that same 100 miles, somebody has interacted with a ufo and maybe talk to spacemen you know and he said and basically if you haven't experienced something you know someone who has that is the state of our planet this happens this is normal and i was like so it's like six degrees of kevin bacon but with weirdness (laughs) you know so that's more fun and that's when my daughter Morgana looked at me and said, that's the name of the podcast, mom. That's what we're going to call it. And so if you go to six degrees of John it's six as a digit and then degrees of John Keel all ran together with no capitals. You can see there's some essays in the blog. We haven't updated that in a while, but there's lo- all of the episodes of the podcast. I think we're at one thirty five this week when I put up this week's post and you can also look at all of my art that's you know been done for the podcast which lots of the fairy art is from the podcast I've spoken not only with uh Neil here I've also spoken with other authors like Morgan Daimler uh Kat Heath uh Daniela Samina Sanima my dyslexia hates her name um but she's the one who wrote where fairies meet and she's she is not to be missed she's from romania and it's really interesting to find how the eastern european and western european lore is so similar and yet they're separated by you know hundreds and hundreds of miles Mm -hmm. um i've also spoken with josh kutchen a lot um and he's he's very fairy interested although i think he's a little a little jealous because he's never seen one <laughs> i told him if we ever meet up i'll try to like help him Invite out them, yeah <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll give a shot um and uh we've also spoken with greg bishop we talk about ufos um bigfoot well i've talked with a flesh and blood bigfooter and i warned him that you know morgana and i are so woo over here but <laughs> you know, we, we got along and it was great. Um, and yeah, we talk about our home state a fair amount, uh, in, in large part, because I think West Virginia is strange. Um, it is the only state completely enclosed in 
Appalachia, in the Appalachian region. Um, I think maybe that adds a little extra weirdness to it. Uh, and most of the boundaries to it are natural. They're most it's the state is mostly bounded by rivers. Hmm. Also possibly a, a significant thing. Um, so there's lots of that, you know, and it's it's a lot of fun. And we talk with witches and skeptical people, sort of, uh, but lots of UFO people and Bigfoot people. It sounds very much like what we do here on our podcast where we, we have a base and then we, we try and sort of keep it as broad as possible uh, because there is no one answer within one area, I don't think. And unless we start cross-pollinating uh, ideas and theories um, and look at similarities and differences between uh, between all the sort of other uh, things that happen within our world, then we can start looking really for what the questions are um, and, and what we should be chasing and looking for and um and do we actually want to know the truth? Mm. Do we, you know, that's the big question. Do, do we really want to know? I, I love the fact that these things are unseen and curious and, um, yeah. you know, are, 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 are kind of just on the parameters of, of who we are as human beings. It's uh, That's what makes it exciting. Can I ask, um, what's up and coming for you? Uh, what's in the future? Um, well, I'll probably start writing on the book very soon mm. um, because most of the book research is done except for now I have to go through physics and um like science of light which uh my co-author is like not a science person so he's basically said ah no you can do that <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> oh can you can you not just pull in some you know random scientist just to add a, a, a nice bit of a chunky chunky bit of essay in there for you I'm very lucky in that I'm friends with uh, an astrophysicist and another astrophysicist. So I'm really, really lucky in that I can go to them with what I think I understand about something and go, okay, do I have this right? Uh Or am I being stupid and (laughs) not getting it? You know, (laughs) what's going on here? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I have two readers who can then confirm or deny, you know, it's like, no, you went so woo in there that it's just not, (laughs) you know, or, okay. Yeah. You got the concept and then you ran with it. That's good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's brilliant. that's, That's how it'll work. And, and what else for the, for, for the podcast? Have you got more guests coming up? Oh Yeah. We we always have some new guests. I've got some interesting uh, people coming in. This week's episode is going to be called uh, Mountaineers Are Always Weird, which is a play on the West Virginia State motto, which is Montani's Semper Libri, just Mountaineers Are Always Free. So this the, my my version is now Montani's Semper Weirdly. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's a joke, um, and I'll, I know I'll have to note, yes, I know the proper le- Latin, and I didn't use it, hush, I know weird is like an Anglo-Saxon word, go away, uh, because I took five years of Latin, so don't start with me. <laughs> Bless you. Um, so yeah, we're going to have, we're going to have some really cool people coming up, and uh, yeah, and, and, and- I'll, I'll do art for just fun too, so. Do you not sell your art? Do you have you? Do you not sell it? I should. Yes. Um, what I need to do is find a really good print-on-demand that mm-hmm. will drop ship to the patrons, so I don't have to deal with collecting tax and mm-hmm. uh, because the state of Ohio does it really weirdly, mm-hmm. and they make it very difficult. And I'm like, I don't want to hire an accountant for God's sake. This is just, uh, so I'll get around to it. I'm really bad at the business end of art, but I am really good at doing the art part. So I think that's most artists. So I'm in your camp with that one. It's like, you, you know, I, I can sit all day long and make and create, but you put numbers and tax re- return forms in front of me and I just want to run away and cry. Yeah. 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 That's how I feel. That. Neil, before we go, and I know you'll have a million burning questions, but is there any burning questions or any way you want to round this up? I just want to say thank you very much, Barbara. That's been a fascinating uh, conversation that's gone in many different directions. I mean, usually 
but usually when Kate and I do this, we don't have a structured um, for, format for, for the interview. We don't sort of set you up with a load of questions and uh, maybe maybe sometimes it shows but <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it, I think it always makes for a better conversation if it's just a bit free flowing and it certainly has been uh, today I in if, if we can have a future conversation that would be great because I we only touched at the end there on the pareidolia phenomenon and I'm can... currently just putting together an article that's my next article on dead but dreaming where I'm going to talk about this and just put out a few ideas and see how much flack I get back for it that's the usual way of doing it but I, I would like to go a little bit deeper with you on that subject in in the Certainly. future but that's Certainly. you know we're, you know that's 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 one for the future and ho hopefully you'll okay. come back yeah, yeah we'd love, love I, to have I... you yeah, I would love to have you back on. Um, I, yeah, touched on so much that we that we could uh, we could talk more on definitely. But um, we and hold are... on before you before you go, Kate, you forgot to congratulate me on on doing the screen uh, the screen screen share. Was wasn't that absolutely seamless the way I did it? Absolutely did professional. It really well. He did. He did. A professional till the end, Neil. Well done. Well done. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.